social Darwinism, eugenics, human zoos. Ugh. If you're over 21, pour yourself a drink because this episode on race is going to be a bit of a doozy. Welcome to another episode of Anthropology in 10 or Less. Today we're exploring our third part in our series on race by examining the concepts surrounding social Darwinism, eugenics, and human zoos. In the last episode of race, we talked about the rise of the concept of race itself and some of the first classifications made by scientists like Linnaeus. But by the beginning of the 19th century, these classifications weren't just present, they had become a kind of common sense as people forgot that these were artificially created categories. Also. I should say honestly that anthropologists weren't innocent during this period and did a lot of awful things. I promise that most of us aren't like that now, but it's absolutely important to understand that the harm that anthropologists did in the early days was significant. Make no mistake, for a long time anthropology was used as a tool of oppression. Now in the 19th century, two men came along that profoundly impacted these ideas of racial classifications and purity. The first was Comte Joseph Arthur de Gibbonnau, who published several volumes between 1853 and 1855 called Essays on Inequality of the Human Races. In it, he described three different races of man and used his ideas to falsely justify the superiority of whites. The second was Herbert Spencer. Spencer coined the famous term survival of the fittest, which found its way into the fifth edition of Darwin's work on the origin of species. In many ways, Spencer was one of the founders of the concepts of social Darwinism, which basically argues that white racial superiority was the reason for the successes of Europeans. It's really important to note, however, that the idea of social Darwinism was around long before Spencer was even born. It's basically a quote, scientific way of saying that Europeans had a manifest destiny. Basically, instead of talking about conquest and superiority in terms of God's blessing, as was done for centuries before, the 19th century brought us pseudoscientific explanations for white supremacy and used a kind of quote, rationalism to justify the horrific things that people did. This is a good example of how we justify things based on our cultural lens. And as a cultural lens changes, so do our justifications that doesn't make them any less awful. From social Darwinism came, quote, evidence in the form of things like craniometry, which is the idea that you can measure head size to indicate racial background. You can't. Also, anthropologist Paul Broca came up with the idea that bigger brains equals more intelligence and set out to support the idea that Europeans' larger heads meant larger brains. Wrong. While it would take till much later in history to demonstrate that brain size does not indicate intelligence, anthropologist Franz Boas demonstrated that actually head size varies widely within populations. In other words, Europeans' heads come in all shapes and sizes, as do Africans, Asians, indigenous people, and really everybody else. He discovered this in a study where he examined the head size and shape of immigrant populations from all over the world living in the city of New York. Between 1908 and 1910, Boaz sampled approximately 18,000 people, a sample size that was almost unheard of in the early 20th century. In addition to discovering the great deal of variation in head size and shape, he also discovered that size and shape changed radically after only one generation, demonstrating that head size, at least, is extraordinarily plastic in humans. In anthropology, we also had the rise of anthropometrics, which was the study of human physical traits. Now, by itself, this is basically just an arm of the study of anatomy and was important for medical science. But anthropometrics got tied up in things like, quote, racial classifications and attempted to show that certain races have a particular kinds of types. They don't. In fact, there is no physical trait or phenotype that is exclusive to one group of people. Now, by that, I mean that while certain traits are more common in some groups and almost non-existent to others, all traits are perfectly transferable across the human species. All human groups can produce healthy and viable offspring with other human groups, which means that we're one species and that this concept of race is imaginary. That doesn't mean, however, that the concept doesn't have dangerous consequences. I should note here that negative racial classifications also included poor whites. In fact, in the book White Trash, the 400-year untold history of class in America, scholar Nancy Eisenberg demonstrates how being poor and white in many ways was and is also a terrible position to be in society and comes with its own kind of oppression. Remember, we talked about this in the last episode on race. The concept of race is also a tool of class control. 
So this leads to the study of eugenics, the movement that ultimately spawned individuals like this. Now, Hitler was by no means the founder of eugenics, but he and the Holocaust are a dangerous example of what happens when you rely on pseudoscience and concepts like racial purity. The term eugenics was coined by a man named Sir Francis Galtung in 1883, and the term basically means well-born. Now, the concept of a, quote, pure race was nothing new, and in the document's Notes on the State of Virginia, Thomas Jefferson said, quote, the circumstance of superior beauty is thought worthy of attention in the propagation of our horses, dogs, and other domestic animals. Why not that of man? Which was very eerily mimicked in the eugenics literature of the 19th and 20th centuries with this. How long are we Americans to be so careful for the pedigree of our pigs and chickens and cattle, and then leave the ancestry of our children to chance or blind sentiment? So the concept of racial purity and the pollution of these imaginary categories of race was nothing new. I should note that eugenics included the, quote, breeding out of criminal behavior, disabilities, disease, mental illness, and yes, even laziness. Curse you lazy person for wanting to waste time on YouTube. Go and do something productive with your life. We often think of eugenics as something distant or something the Nazis engaged in. The reality is far worse. In fact, eugenics was so popular in the United States that it even had an arm in the government in places like the Eugenics Records Office, which lasted from 1910 to 1939. President Teddy Roosevelt, for example, was a huge fan of eugenics. Check out the link below to see his letter to Charles Davenport in support of eugenics. People who were not considered pure were often prevented from having access to society in a number of ways. Eugenics was largely about discrimination and exclusion and still is. Another really awful consequence of the eugenics movement was forced sterilization. More than 32 states had eugenics-based laws on the books and made it legal to sterilize both men and women, though it was honestly women who took the brunt of this practice. This map from 1935 shows that at this point there were already 21,000 cases of forced sterilization. It should be noted that according to some records, as many as 25% of Native American women who received medical treatment in the 1970s were sterilized. In Puerto Rico, the practice was even worse. By 1965, nearly one third of the Puerto Rican women were unable to have children as a result of these policies. There are several documentaries out there that cover this part of history that you may want to check out. Links are below. And it gets even worse because it's actually not over. Between 2006 and 2010, an estimated 150 female inmates in the California prison system were sterilized. The result of the audit showed that 39 of these women did not consent to the procedure. Now, this was officially banned in 2014, but this practice is painfully recent. And here's the thing, with discussion on altering genes and the development of things like CRISPR, this discussion of eugenics is very relevant today and totally applicable. This is not to say that gene therapy like CRISPR couldn't do some amazing and wonderful things. It absolutely can and should. But we should be having these conversations about just where this can go. Check out the episode on Radiolab on CRISPR that I've linked below. Lastly, let's talk about human zoos. Really, the human zoo is the ultimate symbol for the exotic other. It's the fact that we can dehumanize people to the point that we feel comfortable putting them behind bars and on display for the masses. These zoos existed in both the United States and Europe. Hundreds of thousands of people visited these exhibits. One example is the 1904 World's Fair in St. Louis, which featured pygmies from the African Congo. One of these men, by the name of Otabenga, was put in the Bronx Zoo in New York after the fair was over and forced to live in the monkey house so he could basically be put on display as evidence for evolution. You can learn more about this man's story in the book Spectacle, The Astonishing Life of Otabenga. But the most famous example of this exploitation is probably that of Sarah Bartman, also known as the Hot and Tot Venus. In 1810, Sarah Bartman was 20 years old and had just arrived in London from her home in South Africa. She was put on display on approximately 200 occasions before she was bought by a Frenchman as a slave in 1814 and moved to France. While in France, she was forced to take orders from an animal trainer. She also became the object of scientific study and was subjected to all manner of tests and experiments. But a year later, Sarah Bartman's popularity no longer drew the crowds it once did, and her owners forced her into prostitution until she died of what was most likely syphilis at the age of 25. But even her death didn't end her shame. Both her brain and genitals were preserved and put on display in Paris until 1985, and it wasn't until 2002 that her remains were finally returned home to South Africa. All of what I mentioned in this episode is an example of just how the concept of race can impact people's lives. 
There's no doubt with the recent resurgence of white supremacy that we need to be having these conversations about race. Understanding the history of all this allows us to look deeper and shed light on the fact that race is a made up and very dangerous concept. But cheer up, there's hope. In our next episode on race, we'll take a look at the people and the science that debunked all this nonsense as we look at the end of scientific racism. But that's all we have time for in this episode of Anthropology in 10 or Less. We'll see you next time. But real quick, real quick though, before you go, consider taking a trip over to our Patreon page and becoming a contributor to this show. We would absolutely love to get more episodes up faster, but it's just not possible without support. Plus, for supporters, there are perks. So head over and check it out. Thanks.